do. Scott, nice to see you. Hello, hello. How's it I going? I imagine people are, are getting tired from the day, but hopefully still have a little bit more energy. Uh, I'm think, doing really well. I think just revved up from all the learning is how people are feeling. Well, that's, that's good to know. It's great to hear. Yeah. And where are you joining us from? I'm actually based out of Vancouver, Canada. So out on the West Coast. It's oh, early man. afternoon for me. You guys sent us, I'm in the East Coast of the U.S. You guys sent us your smoky skies. I think it's a little bit more Alberta, but yeah, I know you're definitely mm-hmm. right. It's been a bit of a, a crazy year. Uh, just yeah. like, it's been incredibly hot, which for Vancouver is pretty nice because the, you know, it's, it's summer now. It's nice and warm. We can go hiking, see the mountains, but Yes, not so great for anyone downwind of, of this area. But. Yeah, yeah, but good. I hope you're getting some good hiking in. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. Well, we will give the floor to you, and I'll pull up your slides. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, let's jump into it. So LLMs in production part two. You'll see the, the red theme here. This is for the, the company I work at. And so, um, hello, I'm Scott Mackey. I, I'm a founding engineer at MEM. And today we're gonna to talk about a very exciting topic, something I'm very passionate about, which is combining LLMs with knowledge bases to prevent hallucinations. A little wordy, but I, I think the topic itself is really, really exciting. And so what you can see here, this is what we are building. I wanna say we, I'm referring to the company I work at, which is MEM. We're building a personalized AI knowledge assistant. Uh, one way to think about this is like chat GPT, but it has access to your email, your calendar. Um, it understands what you're working on. And I like to, to tell people, you, I think of it as a personalized executive assistant, right? My EI, yeah, you want to ask them, hey, can you summarize those meeting notes? That kind of thing. Um, and the reason that I'm so excited about uh, preventing hallucinations and work with knowledge bases is that the thing that matters the most to me, at least, uh, when working with an assistant is that they're not going to lie to you. They're going to tell you the truth. They're going to go and prevent um, anything weird from happening. Uh, they're they're going to make sure that every piece of information they're sharing with you is accurate and factually true. So what are we going to cover today? Uh, there's three things that I'm going to walk through. First thing is quick intro into what are hallucinations. Second thing. Why do we want to prevent them? Why do we even care about all this? And then the third thing is we're actually going to walk through a real world scenario, which is building a QA and a chatbot for Bevy, which is a game making framework. And the reason I chose Bevy is because um, it's it's actually something personal to me. Uh, I've been trying to build a Rust game on the side and something that's been really challenging has been trying to go and learn it when there's, it's, it's not a language I worked with before, not a framework I've worked with before. I've never done game development. And I think it's a really great example of a scenario where a Q&A chatbot can be extremely useful, but something like ChatGPT isn't good enough. And so we'll go and do a deeper dive in that later, but um, that's going to be the bulk of the presentation is focusing on the real world scenario. Maybe one thing to add to this section is that I'd love for people to take away from today uh, that this is something you can go and build yourself, right? It's not extremely challenging, and you can actually use this set of slide decks in this presentation as a reference or guidebook for actually taking all of these, you know, different different learnings and applying them to your own work. So, what are hallucinations? When an LLM hallucinates, it's producing imagined output, and so I think like a really obvious version of this is. You go and you ask it for some source and it gives you some link and the link is, is just totally false, right? There, there's two main types. So one of them is fabrication of facts and the second is faulty reasoning. So the first, fabrication of facts, I have a little example here. It might be a little challenging for everyone to read, but essentially what I've done is I've gone to chat GPT. This is the 3.5, so GPT 3.5 Turbo, and this is the May 24 version. And I ask it, hey... If you could recommend one behavioral economics paper to me, which one would it be? And can you give me its name and ID? And it goes and responds with a name, which is nudging individuals towards better financial decisions. And it sounds like a, a real paper, right? It sounds like Richard Thaler's famous like work on nudge. Um, and it gives us this link, right? And when you actually go and take a look at that ID, you'll realize that the citation is made up. It's not the correct paper, right? This paper, I, I can even find one that has the exact matching name online. 
maybe it's somewhere, but it's very like challenging to go and actually track down if it does exist. And, and you can just tell like the LLM has just lied to me about this being a proper source. Another example of hallucination, it, it, I really like this one here, which is also the chat GP 3.5 model, but this is an example of faulty reasoning. So I go and ask it, hey, suppose I've got two pounds of feathers and one pounds of bricks. Which one weighs more, right? Two pounds or one pound, right? Two pounds should weigh more. It should say, yes, the feathers weigh more, but it goes, it describes the rationale and it says, no, the feathers are gonna be lighter and you know they don't weigh more than bricks, right? Which is just an example of faulty reasoning. I think what's really interesting about this example is that Chad GP4 is able to get this one correct and some you know larger models are able to do a much better job of reasoning. And I think it hints at over time, um, this class of hallucination becoming less problematic. I, I think another one that's really interesting about this kind of like faulty reasoning hallucination is that there's lots of different strategies you can take to try and improve it. And so you might have seen people sharing prompts online where you're asking it to self-critique, right? Hey, does this make sense to you? And the model might say, oh, I apologize, right? Like that actually doesn't make sense and gets it right the second time. And there's lots of different strategies you can use like tree of thought and all that that can help solve faulty reasoning. But um, what I really want to focus today on is this first kind of hallucination, which is fabrication of facts. So why, why does any of this matter? We might have heard or seen some of these articles around, uh, uh, it was publicized recently. I'm sure there's lots of examples of this, but this is one that kind of uh, blew up a bit, which was a lawyer went and cited some sources from Chad GPT in a court case and they were made up, they were hallucinated. And I think like a lot of people look at this like, ah, oh, you know, why would someone go and not like double check and make sure that they're real? But I think that what I find really interesting is that it's clear that this is a use case, right? This is something that's valuable to people is being able to go and use these tools for research purposes. There's some utility there. And I think it just highlights how important it is to start developing products where you can go and build for this use case, right? Things like legal research, but actually ground it in reality and make sure that anything you are citing is real. And so that's what we're going to spend some time diving into. Two things I want to call it first is, is kind of like what, what's going to change in the future with LLMs, right? Is there's going to be strategies at least today, right? Like some of these prompt optimization tools that you would expect to kind of go out, maybe a bit out of style as the reasoning gets better and other things that are going to stick around. Um, one thing that I think we're going to see improve, and, and ironically it has recently, is improved instruction following. And so anyone that might have seen, I think it was uh, last day or two, OpenAI announced a few um, new language models that had better instruction following capabilities. And what's really useful about this is when you go and ask it to perform certain tasks. So only respond with you know, two words or respond in the JSON scheme format, that kind of thing. They're becoming a lot better at doing that. And so it's much easier to build products on top of tools that are gonna follow the instructions that are provided in the prompts or system messages or, or however you're prompting it. The other things that I think we're gonna see improve, reasoning, so I talked a little bit about that, and then larger context windows. We've already seen this with some models like Claude's uh, like 100K token model and some that might even be larger now. Um, this one's really interesting because it means that some things like compressing documents or having really good information retrieval systems where you're like getting the exact document that has the right data, those are gonna matter a little bit less because we'll be able to stuff more in the context. You can build products that have like, you know, longer chat histories, that kind of thing without having to go and do a bunch of extra engineering on top of it. And so um, really excited for that to be more common. And then something I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about today, but I, I just wanna call out is that fine tuning is going to become a lot more simpler, right? There's lots of companies building the space, trying to help people take maybe their thousands or tens of thousands of user feedback examples and fine tune models for specific use cases like classification. Um, I think that fine tuning is really interesting for some things, um, but for generative text, it's, it, it struggles in some areas, specifically when you're trying to go and have something that's factual, right? Like if you need to be 100% true, it's not great at that. Um, what one kind of side note throughout the presentation, I've linked a couple like further reading notes. And so I'd encourage people after, if you're interested in any parts of it to go and read some of these papers. I think the AI space is something that is very unique uh, in that 
it, within the last two years, there's been so, so much new information that uh, reading papers can be really valuable to understand what's the bleeding edge, what direction are things heading, and so on. And so um, one thing I encourage people to do. Yeah. So improvements, what's not going to improve? I think the main thing that is not going to change is the fact that IR systems or information retrieval systems are still going to be required. Right? So LLMs, they won't have access to real-time data. I think a really simple example of this is I might go and say, hey, what's the score of the basketball game right now? Right? That's like a piece of data that I probably want that to be down to like 30 seconds or maybe a minute delayed. But more than that, I'm going to be kind of unhappy. LLMs, there's not really good capabilities now to go and get that data into the underlying like model weights, right? You, you actually need to get into context somehow, and that's going to likely be with some kind of information retrieval system integrating with APIs, that kind of thing. The other thing that the improvements won't solve is 100% trustworthiness. And I think that we're going to get a lot closer to this. I think Jan Kuhn has a really interesting presentation on like autoregressive models and some of their limits. And I think that um, it's clear that at the end of the day, when a fact is produced, you want to be able to point to one or more sources for that fact. And something that the LLMs today struggle with is, is being able to go and say, oh, well, you know, I ingested all this training data. I'm not exactly sure where this came from. Whereas when you're building systems that are maybe a little bit more agentic, right, you've gone, you've gotten some documents, you put them in the context. It's much easier to say, oh, this fact came from here, here, here. Here are some sources, right? Obvious examples are like, um, you know, Bing chat, uh, will go and cite like which websites to pull data from that kind of thing and and you know to to maybe reiterate that's a big part of this talk and like why it's valuable is that this strategy and some of the things we talk about are going to continue to be useful in the future and when you're building these systems you're going to need to be thinking about this so real world scenario we're actually going to dive into it now um building a chat bot to teach us about a topic right a product whatever it is in this case i'm going to use bevy which is a game making framework written in Rust. I'm not really familiar with Rust. I've worked in a number of languages, but it's not one I've really been exposed to that much. And um, again, like this, this strategy could be used for many different systems where you're trying to do the same kind of thing. And so you can imagine a product where they have a help support center, right? With a bunch of different documents, like some knowledge base. That's going to be very similar to this. If you're trying to go in and build on some other tools where they're just like a bunch of facts that you want to query over, right? Things like chat PDF, right? All of these strategies are going to be very similar. Um, the reason I'm excited about Bevy, again, is because I've been trying to go and build a game and learn how to use Bevy. And one of the first things I did was I leaned for chat GPT and said, hey, right? Like I can use this great tool to help me learn what APIs I should be using. How do I go and render sprites? How do I go and make like the, the very performance? So on. The problem is that all of the data is out of date for the current versions of Bevy. Um, I think ChatGPT has data from 2021 and the Bevy framework has been updated like a hundred times since then and lots of the APIs have been broken. And so every time I go and generate something, I get some error and it can't help me with the errors because it doesn't know about the newer APIs. Um, so it's been frustrating because it feels like there's this great tool, but I can't really leverage it for, for my purposes. And so that's what inspired me to go and put this together. Um, so the, the main thing that, that I want to make sure is happening is how do we avoid hallucinations and make sure that it's telling me truthful things that I can use? When you're trying to build this kind of system, the very first thing that you need to do is provide the chatbot access to some knowledge base, right? And so a knowledge base, can, it, it, like it's, it's kind of a vague word, uh, but I think generally it can refer to a bunch of information um, in multiple formats, right? So it could be facts in a list, it could be documentation, it could be files, it could be website, support center, that kind of thing. And essentially what we're just trying to do is like collect it into one spot so that the chatbot can reference it. In this example, I'm using data from three sources. So there's web tutorials, which is the Bevy website. There's the docs and code examples. And so when you actually go and take a look at Bevy, they got lots of examples, building like a breakout game, that kind of thing. And then the GitHub FAQ. Um, the GitHub FAQ is really interesting because this is actually live data that is, you know, you could download a snapshot of it, but ideally we'd actually be able to use the GitHub APIs to interface with it. And so um, 
I've kind of split them out into two strategies. One is downloaded the web tutorials and docs and code examples, so a snapshot in time, right? In, in this example, as we're working through the chatbot, this is actually some code that I've written. I plan to share it later this week. Um, just open source it if anyone wants to go and take a look at it. And recently went and took a snapshot of web tutorials and docs and code. And then the GitHub FQ is actually integrated using an API. Um, the second part, right? So once we've got all the information from the chatbot reference, second part is building guardrails. So the chatbot is only responding with answers that are grounded in reality. And what I mean by that is we want to make sure that whenever you're asking questions, it's using data from the knowledge bases. It's not pulling data from its that is encoded in its training weights, right? We actually want to be able to point to some source. I think uh, an example that I like to think about is you can imagine, um, you know, someone in, uh, they, they can't speak, right? And all they have access to is, is knowledge base files. All they can do to answer your questions is point at things. I think that's a really good way of like mentally modeling this out is you want to go and build the system so that it's always pointing at something and then it's going to be grounded in reality. It's not making something up. Um, what, one example I want to highlight on these slides is the math example here. So what is two plus two? Because it feels like why, why would you not let the bot do this, right? Like it's going to be able to know, you know, ChatGPT can do basic math, right? What is two plus two if the user wants to know that? Why are we going to deny that functionality from them? Why would we say like, you know, oh no, you can't do this. The reason is all about setting the right expectations for the user, right? So if you're thinking of user experience, if you're answering some math problems, right? Two plus two to the power of nine, right? And then you ask it something like, what's the, you know, is one, two, three, four, six a prime number? Um, it's not going to be able to solve all of the math problems because that's not part of the knowledge base. And it's been known to hallucinate these kinds of scenarios, right? And I think like math's one example, but there's other things like weather, geography, right? In, in this case, like email here, fix this code and send me an email, right? That's taking a an action it's using some capability that we don't have you know we don't give it access to and so a big part of building systems is how do you go and help educate the user around what the capabilities are and kind of add some guardrails so they stay on the right paths so what are the types of questions that it should answer um the ones that we're going to be focusing on are questions like this right can i build a 3d game with bevy that's really simple, right? One that I'm interested in is how do I add keyboard controls to my game? I want to be able to like move some character around on the screen. What code do I need to write to do that? Um, I'm experiencing bug. Those are the kind of questions that should be like our happy path style questions. Those are the ones we want to encourage users to use. Now, how do we actually know if the system is working, right? Well, when you're building software, you don't really write tests. Um, you might have heard the word evals thrown around a lot. I think that, that is like a more advanced version of this essentially. But um, our goal is to be able to go and say, given some inputs, we're able to go and validate the outputs. Um, what's hard about working with LLMs is that there can be like a, a million different inputs, right? People can ask any questions, but then also for certain inputs, there can be many different valid outputs, right? If I go and ask it, how do I handle keyboard input for my game? there could be a, a ton of different valid answers. And so something that's important when you're trying to evaluate the system um, is that if you're writing some tests, you want to go and try and isolate what the important parts of the system that you want to validate are. And so in this case, there are two main things, right? When I'm asking this question, I want to understand how do I handle key presses? Someone press the key. And how do I connect all this to the game state so it's all wired up? So this here, this is a... Like the first screen here showing the example of chatbot, right? This is just a CLI tool. Again, I'm going to share some code if someone's curious. Obviously, it's not very pretty, but it's meant to try and simplify the system as much as possible. And what you can see here is like, I asked it some question, how do I handle keyboard input from a game? And it gives me a response. What the eval should be looking at is certain pieces of it, right? And so here I'm saying, oh, you know, this here, add system, keyboard input system, right? That's the handler. It's registering the handler. And then the key press handler, right? So key code left, that's saying, oh, you know, this is how I go and set up key codes and key commands that are going to work with the system. Uh, so if you're actually like writing a test for this kind of thing, you want to try and match it. And right, it's going to be a bit of a fuzzy match, not going to be perfect. Right? Your test might be a little tiny bit flaky, but I think that's okay because the main goal of the eval systems is to go and evaluate improvements over time, right? If you're adding new capabilities, if you're changing parts of the system, if you're changing prompts, is it becoming more or less accurate? 
as you have more and more evals, it's going to matter less about like one specific one during one test run. It's more just helping you build in a specific direction. Yeah. Another example is the unhappy paths. And so uh, what is the capital of Canada, right? This is a question that ChatGPT would be able to answer, um, but we explicitly want to make sure it's not answering this. Because again, we want to go and reinforce that we're not a geography bot. We're not going to answer like, you know, weird questions about geography. So we're not going to answer any questions about geography. We're going to be focused on task and like the workflows that we've defined. And what we'd like to have happen is like it responds with something like, hey, sorry, uh, I'm not able to answer that question. But if you have any questions about Bevy, let me know. That's the kind of thing that we would like it to, to do. Maybe one thing to highlight here is that you don't want to end up in a situation similar to Alexa or um, some of these have like voice activated um, assistants where you ask it to do something and it says, sorry, I can't do that. And then you're just stuck, right? You don't necessarily understand the system capabilities. You want the system to help the user along and point them in the right direction. And so it's, it's always a balance of like, you want some guardrails, but you don't want it to be too hard. You want to kind of like shove the user back, you know, towards the, the, the right direction. Uh, so I know we're, we're coming up on time, but um, I'm going to like continue plugging through, but let me know if uh, I, need, I need to pause for any moment. So, um, so evals. All right, last point on evals is that they should cover five main cases. The first case is hero use cases. So again, this is what I defined at the beginning, right? Like what are the kinds of questions that we wanna be able to answer? The second case, system capabilities. And so as you're building this, right? You can imagine I had one source was GitHub, one source was these explicit files that went embedded and, and so on. And um, making sure that we're testing all the different capabilities of the system, right? Like this might be referred to as white box testing. You wanna go and hit every code path edge cases, missing or conflicting data, um, user-driven use cases. So if you're building a tool, right, like a product that you want lots of users to use, I think immediately you're going to even see lots of users try specific use cases, either good or bad, and you want to make sure you're turning those into evals so that as you're building the future, you're preventing regressions, but then you're also helping codify it so that if you're working with teammates, um, they're going to understand, like, what should the capabilities of the system be? And then the last thing is the non-workflow scenarios. So this was things like the Canada geography example. So finally, at the chatbot itself, right? A basic chatbot. This is, if you've looked at any story online, like this is the very simple, like get started with the API example, right? A user makes some query. We have something, I'm referring to it as an agent here. That's purposeful because an agent is someone who can take like multiple actions depending on you know, different inputs. And, and we'll expand upon that. Um, the agent turns around to things like chat GPT or some other LLM, you know, pipes data along it responds. And we'll see here, right? In, in my little example, I've only written 20 evals for this little chat bot. Ideally, if you have a larger system, you're probably looking at like a couple hundred, maybe more than that, but this is just trying to, to keep it simple. Um, and what you'll see here is I ask a question, what is the key code for the spacebar button? The key code for the spacebar button is 32. Um, this is just like input output. This is not the answer that I want. Right? The answer that I actually want here is the word like key code colon colon space bar space or something like that. Um, but it's not giving me the correct response because it doesn't know that we're talking about bevy. Now, the second thing I do, right, and, and you'll see like some version notes at the top here, is we go and instruct the LLM, right? And we're saying, hey, you know, we're adding some things to the prompt. You know, your, your goal is to provide support and answer questions related to Bevy and the Rust programming language. After you go and do that, you'll see the evaluation success increases pretty dramatically. You'll see here that, you know, what's the key code for the spacebar button? In Bevy, you can use key code space. That's a successful eval. That's exactly what I want to see. Now, what's the latest version? As of August 9th, it's 0.5.0 and it's 2021. That's not what I wanted to see, right? I want to be able to see today what is the latest version of Bevy. And so this is the problem that we want to try and solve is how do we go and ground it in real information, not just in this training data. Before we do that, there's one more step that I want to add, which is putting up some of those guardrails. How do we go and like help make sure that we're on the happy path? It's not responding to things like what's two plus two. And one strategy for this is using something called like React. You might have seen like tool former or function calling. This is something that OpenAI recently highlighted in one of their blog posts. Um, there's lots of different strategies for that, but I think like the OpenAI function calling is really simple. And so I'd encourage folks to like take a look and try it out if they haven't done it already. 
this is how you go and like let the model go and select different actions to take. And in my case, I want to say, hey, let's only generate valid answers about Bevy. And if it's not about Bevy, right, if it's something off topic, you're talking about the capital of Canada, then we're going to respond to something else, right? We can still generate some response. Maybe it's like, hey, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to talk about that topic, but if you have questions about Bevy, something like that, right? But you're trying to go in and separate it from situations that we expect to handle, situations we don't. After I do that, the value of success increases a little bit more. And you'll see when I say something like, I am hungry, it says, sorry, I can only answer questions related to Bevy, right? It's not going to go and help me plan out my dinner. And that's good, right? And that's helping set the expectation for the user. Finally, we're at knowledge retrieval. This is where things start to get a little bit more exciting. And so you want to go and take your system and wire it up to like ground it somewhere, right? And you, there's probably been like a bunch of other presentations on the other track and this track today talking about this concept of you want to have some data, you put it somewhere for a recall. Um, one of the most popular examples of this is using embeddings and storing things in some vector store and being able to go and, and run your queries using semantic search. I think that's one example. I think that you can also just use something like Elasticsearch for this. Um, it's out of scope for this talk. What I'm using in my little chatbot example is an embedding based strategy where you're going and like using semantic search on them. But I think that the, the thing that I want to highlight is it doesn't necessarily matter what kind of system, like how it's built. What does matter is you put in some semantic query and, or, or any query really, you put in some query and you go and get knowledge that's going to be relevant to the user's query. And that's what's required to go and build and ground these systems. Once you get the data, you take it and you put it in the response generation context and you say, here are some documents or some knowledge that we went and gathered. Use this knowledge when generating your response, right? And you want to highlight it and say, only use the knowledge that I'm giving you, right? Don't use the knowledge from your training weights. Use the knowledge that's in like this set of data. And if it's not there, then, then say you don't know. And you see here, our eval has gone way up, right? We're able to go and return, oh, Bevy's 0.1.0, right? Or 0.10. This is fantastic. It's now responding to the right data. A couple more improvements we can make to this kind of system are tool based knowledge retrieval. And so this is taking that similar approach we just used, right? React, where you're going to go and plan and you're going to say, hey, given this question, where do I want to go and look for the data? Do I want to go to the docs that are stored in this document store or do I want to go and look at the GitHub FAQs? And that just happens to be another source for our knowledge base, like another source that we can query, right? There's some great papers. I think Gorilla is like a really interesting one. Um, but um, that does a really good job. And you'll see that there is about like 10% to our evals who are actually using data that was only retrievable via the GitHub FAQs. And so our success rate increased here. Last thing that I think is really exciting is knowledge evaluation, which is once you go and get data from the knowledge retrieval step, you have something which looks at all those results and decides, can I answer this question or not? Right? If no, you'll see it's, it might be a little bit hard to see, but you can respond with unable to answer, right? I, I don't know. Right, that that one can say, oh, you know, I checked my facts, but I'm not really sure how to answer that. Maybe it provides like some recommendations. Go check GitHub. This is what I would recommend if you actually want to go and find out the answer here. But the other thing it can do is it can actually go and highlight, uh, oh, you know, these three pieces of knowledge are useful for generating the results, and you should use them and cite them. And what this looks like uh, as an implementation is that now when it goes and finds that one document that was mentioning Bevy is version 0.10, it goes and it grabs it and will go and return that. Um, so if you take a look here, right, the knowledge evaluation step will turn around to the response generation step and say, hey, there's this specific file, use it in your generated prompt, put it in your citations. And then you can go and see like system here, again, the UI is not beautiful, but it goes and says source one came from this file. All right, our eval rates are, are up again. Um, Another case here, this is when it's saying, hey, I didn't find any information. You can try looking elsewhere, right? That, that was that red path where it said, I don't know. It's unable to answer the question. Now, even with all those improvements that we've done and, and put in place, um, 
it's still not entirely comprehensive, right? It can't solve every situation. In, in this case, it doesn't really understand temporal queries of, oh, you know, what was the notable feature from 2022? That's why our EDAW rate is not 100%. And I think like the percentages here, again, don't really matter that much. Um, it's really just meant to be an indicator of, are you moving in the right direction, right? Over time, I'll be adding more evals to this. The eval percentage is going to go down. I'll add more capabilities. It'll go up, right? And so it's really just meant to be as a marker for, are you improving? Are you getting better at the use cases that you want the user to use? So nearly done. Two last things. Um, future improvements. There's a bunch of potential ways you could take this next, right? I think the ones that are most exciting are introducing some kind of planning or task loops. Right? If you have multi-hop queries where you need to go get data from here and here and here and combine it, that's something where a task loop comes in, play, in handy. If you want to go and um, enhance the quality of retrieval, there's some really interesting things where you can pre-process the documents that you're storing in the system Right for you know those examples where you're storing the, the code files. Uh, temporal querying, that was the example we looked at. And then one that's really challenging, resolving conflicting data. So if you have different things from multiple sources, how do you handle that? That one's really tricky. Um, and then improving observability and interpretability, right? Like when you're looking at the bot that I was showing, you can't really understand what it's thinking, what decisions it's making. Um, I think some things like the ChatGPT plugin system is trying to do that and go and like highlight a few things, but it's not perfect, right? It feels like there's better, um, some better UX out there. And I think there's more exploration to do there. Uh, if it, <laughs> so a quick plug for Mem, if any of these are interesting to you, I think every single one of these, everything that we work through, those are the kinds of challenges that I'm thinking about every day working with the team on. And so if you're interested in joining, I would recommend checking out our careers page. So last thing, right? The two lovers, two things that are really important when you're building these kinds of systems, providing access to the knowledge base, right? There's a bunch of ways to do that, but that's the most important thing. And it should be using that data in its responses and it should only be using that data in its responses. And the second thing is the guardrails. And that's just to help bring the user to the spots where you have knowledge. So they're not asking all these questions that you're just not gonna be able to answer. And that was a bunch of stuff. We're a little bit over time, um, but uh, I have a link here. The bevybot.chat is where I'm gonna go and share some of this stuff after I'll just be on GitHub. That's just a, an easy link. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone has some uh, questions. I'd be happy to answer, but I know we're a little bit over. Awesome, thank you so much, Scott. Um, you said there was a link you were gonna share? Did you wanna? Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. So uh, in in this here, you can see https slash slash bevy dash bot dot chat. That's where it's oh, gonna okay. be shared. It'll rearrange. I haven't uploaded the code there yet. I've got to clean awesome. up just a tiny bit before it's ready for public. But um, over the next couple of days, I'll go and share it there. And I encourage people to go and, and check it out. Okay, awesome, awesome. Um, I think one question I'm seeing in the chat from Apurva, who is uh, one of our fearless MLOps community leaders in Toronto, she's asking, how do we add in evals? Is it mostly through prompt engineering? That's a really good question. And so I think there's two ways to think about it. Let me jump back here for a quick sec. So um, the simplest way to like create evals is to actually write a test suite that is integrating with some live version of your system. So that might be a staging or a production equivalent and you're actually running it live, right? If you run any kind of smoke tests on your system before, this is the kind of thing that it would do. Um, and this chatbot module, that process message would actually make the API call to your agent, process it, get the response. And then you could do, like in this example, this is some TypeScript code, which goes and checks, did the response text include X, Y, Z? I think in the future, there's lots of really interesting um, folks that are working on how do we build LLMs, which might be fine-tuned or just like uh, specialized in evaluating the outputs of other LLMs. So you could actually build your evals using LLMs and then you wouldn't have to do this yourself. You would just say, oh, here's the response, right? And ask the system, is this a good response? And it would be able to go and grade it, maybe give you some score between like zero and 10, and then they use that to go and reinforce or improve the system. But for now, I would definitely like recommend by starting by just keeping it simple, see, do some simple string matching. I think what's really good about the IR style systems, information retrieval, is that for a lot of queries, there is a right answer, right? Like you have a grounding in some specific document, what version is Bevy, right? That should have always produce the same answer. And so for these kinds of systems, it's pretty easy to build evals. If you have a system where it's like a poetry generator, that would be much harder to generate effective evals for. Great, thank you so much. Hopefully that answered your question of Horva. Um, 
And another question that we got, um, thoughts on struct GPT paper? Um, I'm not sure uh, if I recall the struct GPT paper. I don't know if the, the person who shared that would be able to maybe give a little bit more information about it. But yeah. I'd be happy to go and, and read it and share some more information after. Yeah, Drew, uh, hope follow. you heard that. Send us a little bit more information for that question. Another question that came through um, from Ben, um, which of these pipeline steps do you see having the most room for improvement slash growth in the short to medium term? The router yeah. slash planning step or, or the knowledge retrieval and query planning? That's a really good question. I think the one that I found that I always come back to when I'm like, whenever there's there's parts of the system where we're not retrieving the right data, it's it's this knowledge retrieval step. And I think what makes it challenging is that there's so many different ways to do retrieval. One way, like you can think about retrieval, and I think there's some good papers in this, I think it's like SQL LLM or something where it actually goes, we'll write a SQL query that will be executed against your database. And you provide it the schema and it goes and, and you can go and do it and fetch the data live. I think that kind of thing is moving in the right direction of how are we grounding the data? Well, we're actually able to go and live interact with certain parts of the system. And it feels like there's so many interesting opportunities there on like introducing new kinds of uh, retrieval, but then also synthesis, right? And so I, I talked a little bit about like how hybrid systems are really common. Um, where's that slide? So that's when you're, you have like Elasticsearch and something like Pinecone and, and you're combining the results after you want to make the query, right? Some kind of re-ranking. Um, I think that what is really hard is when you might have like 15 different sources that you want to query, right? You have all these different APIs that the system can interface with. How does it know which one to look for to get the data? Um, one way you can solve it, if it depends on your use case, but some of these agents will go and they'll try source one. Oh, I didn't find it there. Try source two. Oh, I didn't find it there. Try source three. That's hard because the user ends up waiting a long time. But I think there's some interesting things you could do with the UX and you can say like, hey, I'll get back to you in 10 minutes. Let me go and like mm -hmm. check my sources. And so um, I think this is where there's a lot of really interesting work to be done. Um, but once you actually get the knowledge that uh, like grounding it with citations is really important. And I think that's that's a step that I wouldn't want. Like, you know, if you could, it's hard to go and discard of any one of these pieces and, and keep the user trust really high in the system. I think you need everything, but I think that's the part where there's like the biggest amount of room for improvement. Yeah, that's great. And doo -doo, let's see, okay, Drew, I'm, I'm, I know I'm pronouncing your name wrong, Drew, so I'm, I apologize. Um, but Drew followed up on his Struck Club, uh, Struck GPT question uh, by saying, um, do, 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 by saying knowledge graphs being integrated into LLMs through trip, triplet mining. I don't know if that gives you more. Mm. Uh, Interesting. I've read a couple similar papers. I don't know. I, it's like Graph Hop is one, and there might be one or mm -hmm. two others. But um, I, I like, some of the concepts I have seen are when you have the LLM and you will give it essentially some schema of, you know, what attributes in the system, what objects in like, you know, in, in, in knowledge graphs, you'll have the subject predicate, uh, I, I forget the, the last part of it, but it's a triplet, right? And you can go in and feed it a list of like different, you know, nodes and, and edges essentially and say, hey, what kind of query would you like to go and fetch this data? And I think it's similar to the SQL um, LLM style systems, you're actually like empowering the um, knowledge retrieval to specifically say like, oh, I want to go and get all of the people who live in the city, right? And then count them up or something like that. And I think it's really fascinating. I think the really hard part about using knowledge graphs is getting the data into that format. And if you don't already have it there, so like in this case with the knowledge base, it's hard to go and extract that all into a knowledge graph because that process, you're either doing it manually, which is a ton of time and, and you have to keep up to date, or you are um, using an LLM or something else to go and generate triplets that you're going to insert into the system. And th at that point, it might hallucinate or it might, you know, miss data or include extra data. And I think that's where you definitely don't want to end up with, where you have bad data in the system that you can't trust. And so I think that's where it's really tricky. There might be a future where that just becomes like good enough, like human level quality 
and a lot of systems end up being built by, you know, you, you run all of your data through some pre-processing step. And I think like here, what I was trying to get at was um, th this uh, second point, right? Pre-processing here where you're extracting all the enemies, right? These are all the people that are mentioned in the knowledge base. These are all the APIs that are mentioned in the knowledge base. And then when you query it, it's able to go and actually, instead of, you know, performing a search on pine cone to go and get like, oh, these like 10 entities, it's actually able to go to Postgres and a specific table that has all the people and query for anyone that has like a specific name or something like that. So um, I think there's lots of interesting, uh, lots of interesting things in the pre-processing stage. And I think the hardest part of it is still um, just, just getting it into a format that's really high quality. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Uh, one other question. What about hallucination from data within the knowledge base? So I, I guess that question is probably saying essentially like what if the knowledge base is not, doesn't have the right data? Is that mm. the, like, like if, if there's some piece of information, right? Like Bevy is version 0.7 and it's incorrect. Um, I think that's extremely challenging. Right. And I think that's part of this, like the fourth point here on resolving conflicting data. You might have two documents, right? Imagine you're running like an e-commerce store or, or, or a physical store and you have some store hours, right? Like 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then you have another document that says, you know, like on holidays, we're like 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And helping the system understand the difference between the two is really challenging. And, and so the approach that I found best is you can imagine something like this part of the system, the knowledge evaluation, where it, it has, it doesn't just have unable to answer, but it has another one where it says like conflicting sources. And it actually responds to the user that says, hey, I found two different sources. Here's source one, here's source two, look at them yourself, right? And it says, I don't really know, but I'm just going to like try and let you decide. That's what mm -hmm. you, like I, I encourage. I think um, the wiki chat paper is really interesting. They don't use this specific approach. What they do is if they find conflicting data or data that they can't, um, uh, what's the word? Like they can't uh, prove essentially. They're like, they, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the system has made some statement that I don't have any proof or citation about. It'll just remove it from the output altogether. Um, just because it wants to make sure the output is only ever referencing things that it can say are true. So uh, not really a great answer, but it's, you, I think just like helping the user understand why it's saying certain things so mm -hmm. that it's really easy for the user to do the fact checking. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, Petros, I hope that answered your question a bit and feel free to follow up if you want more information. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Scott. I think you're closing out the day. Um, and this was awesome. And it looks like there might be a few more questions, but I'm going to send you over to the chat to answer those if you don't mind. That would be great. I actually do apologize. I do have to hop off. Um, I have a, a, a work thing I need to run to. But if anyone has any other questions, please, please send me an email. You can either reach me on work email at scott at mem.ai or my personal at scott at mackie.live. And so I think my mem.ai should be in my profile. But yeah, happy to answer any questions over email or add me on LinkedIn or something like that. So thank cool. you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me as well. Thanks so much. So long. Yeah.